I don't know if we can turn this around, Lila. This might be the end of our kind of government. The most powerful person in the world, the president of the United States, their character doesn't matter and we've just given up the ghost on that. Is that really where we're at? Neither party represents a truly Christian platform. That's correct. Some principles about what are the most important things to consider when voting. Yes, what are the non-negotiables? And what's so amazing is in 2,000 years of Christianity, there have been some incredible teachings developed to help the faithful understand our role in the role of government. Yes. Mother Teresa, the famous champion of service to the poor, she says that was the gospel on five fingers. You did it for me. St. Augustine watched his world collapsing. It was the end of Christian Rome. And what did he do? He was on Father Ambrose, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for having me back, Lila. Always a pleasure having you on. Lots to talk about today. Yes, lots to talk about. We're going hardcore political today. Great, I'll do my <laughs> best. I'll do my best. <laughs> no, you are the most one of the most prepared guests that come on this show, and you always come with so much knowledge. So, first of all, that for those that aren't familiar yet with you and with St. Michael's Abbey, give us a little background. Okay, so St. Michael's Abbey in here in Orange County, California, Silverado Canyon. It's a monastery of the Premonster Tension Order, the Norbertine Order, 900-year-old uh, religious order, and we're a thriving monastery here in Southern California. We just had 13 new young men join the monastery last Amazing. month. There are over 100 of us in the whole canonry. It's a big, thriving, wonderful epicenter of, of grace and the sacramental life of the church and just a lot of great things happening there. You just celebrated Michael Mus, yes. which is a very special time for you for the Abbey named Saint Michael's Abbey. Correct. How did that go? We had you on the show talking about the Archangels yes. and Saint Michael, which was really beautiful. It was such a beautiful celebration, Lila. Thank you for helping us to pub to publicize that and to get the word out. We were absolutely mobbed with people coming to celebrate on Saturday and Sunday, the the weekend of of uh, the feast of Saint Michael, the Archangel, and the other Archangels. That's September 29th is the feast day. So we had, I think, over 50,000 people follow the novena online in preparation for the feast. That was wonderful with, with reflections, daily reflections, and some live uh, presentations, sermons that my confrères delivered. That's all available on the Abbott Circle, and also I think some of it's on our YouTube channel if you, if you want to catch up. And there were people just there in the church praying not only for Holy Mass and for Solemn Vespers, but their devotionally through the whole weekend. It was really edifying. So many young people, so many young families. They're just bringing all of their intentions to the church through the intercession of the saints because people have these great needs and they're looking for hope and they're looking for light. And I, I think that they found that in this wonderful celebration. It was really edifying. You're, you're so generous. You and all of the Norbertines and all of St. Michael's, I mean, just inviting all of these people to join you to celebrate. And I know people mob come mob mass on Sunday mornings and Vespers. You yes. have a lot of visitors, but I highly recommend anyone listening who makes finds their time, finds themselves out in Southern California to make a visit. Yes, Because it is do. a very special, special place. We had a great um, roundtable discussion with Father Chad Ripperger and Gabe Castillo, who I think has also mm -hmm. been recently on your, on your show, on your podcast. And that's already getting tons of traction online. So it's just fun Amazing. to see. It's fun to bring these collaborations together and also like this one, so Amazing. I love it. Well, listen, there's a lot of hunger out there, and I know you know this, which is why you do what you do for the spiritual good, mm. and there's a lot of hunger for God. And then today, increasingly, I think in politics, it's chaotic, mm. and there's a lot of anger and division and confusion even about how we should show up as American citizens, what that means, and what is even, our, even the, the way of our government, the way mm. our government is structured. I think mm. increasingly there's concern that it's falling apart at the seams. And so what I want to do with you today, which you, I know you're coming out with a series about this too, mm. which you can share about, but is talk about some of these basics, okay. really basics for citizenship and basics for what is the role of government and the role of the individual okay. as God designed it, because this is, there is a natural law order to all of this Yes, and it precedes the American project. Right. I mean, these Absolutely. things, these are not just American inventions. These are rights that we have that precede this country's founding that are given to us by God, not by state. Whenever you have more than one individual at play, there was government, as it were, in the Garden of Eden because there were two 
human individuals there, Adam and Eve. Whenever we come together, we are corporate creatures. We are the social animal, <laughs> you know? We are a political animal, according to Aristotle. We are not meant to be alone. So whenever we are not alone, we can speak about politics. We can speak mm -hmm. about government. We can speak about a, a corporate good. So, mm -hmm. And what's so amazing is in 2,000 years of Christianity, there have been some incredible teachings that have been developed to help the faithful understand our role in the role of government. Yes. The church has always been a real font of wisdom for how we should think about civic life. Okay. So well, there's lots to unpack here, but let's start with the words of our Lord. Okay. So he says, this is in Mark, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. Right. And of course, the context there in the Gospel of St. Mark is the Pharisees trying to trip up our Lord. Are you going to pay the temple tax? That part of the world was under a hostile takeover of the empire, Rome, who had set up governors in Judea. So the, the Jews of our Lord's day found themselves subject to an outside uh, political situation. And they had to try to understand how are we supposed to live in this because it felt like they were under occupation. And so there was this question about what do we owe to God by way of our religious obedience and what do we owe to the government that he has set up. It's a wonderful scene actually mm -hmm. because you remember our Lord tells his apostles, go and cast out a net, uh, a hook into the lake, catch a fish. In the, in the mouth of the fish, you will find a coin. Whose image is on that coin? Caesar's image is on that coin. So then render to Caesar what is Caesar's and render to God what is God's. So our Lord is teaching his followers there that we have to live in uh, the world of a political environment, a, a government that's outside of just our own individual good or even the goods of our, our religious co-believers and understand how we fit into this bigger picture of society. It's very interesting and very beautiful. And also a miracle happens there too, that there's a coin in the mouth of a fish. A, l a little bit of the idea that the Lord always provides, right? Also, if yes. you, Even if you have to pay your taxes, you God know that, somehow, that quotation, somehow that provides. That reminds me of a quotation from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, mm. which cites this passage mm. from Mark. This is number 2239. Here's a quotation about submission to legal authorities, to those who are set up over us. It is the duty of citizens to contribute along with the civil authorities to the good of society in a spirit of truth, justice, solidarity, and freedom. The love and service of one's country follow from the duty of gratitude and belong to the order of charity. Submission to legitimate authorities and service of the common good require citizens to fulfill their roles in the life of the political community. So you see there that we, we Christians are people who love the common good. We also are motivated by love. The love of Christ compels me, says St. Paul, right? Uh, that the love, of, the love of Christ urges me on. And that means that that love that, is, that comes with our holy faith in Jesus Christ moves us to engage in the civil order. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Okay, so then the part that actually quotes, um, render unto Caesar. We don't have to f uh, follow legal authorities that, are, that act contrary to this moral order. So th this is another quotation. Refusing obedience to civil authorities when their demands are contrary to those of an upright conscience finds its justification in the distinction between serving God and serving the political po political community. Render, therefore, to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. We must ob obey God rather than men. That's also from the Catechism. So, so it has that double meaning. Also. Re meaning because everything is God's, including what is Caesar's. If you're giving something to Caesar that belongs to God or that God disapproves of, that's or a problem. If, or if Caesar is compelling us to act contrary to God's law, we, we may not and must not obey a civil authority that is commanding us to sin. So God's law is first, but insofar as the, the political structures around us in whatever day and age we live in are uh, not contrary to our conscience, not contrary to God's law, we should obey them. We should obey the traffic laws because that's for the good of society. There's nothing in the Bible that tells us whether how fast we should drive in a car, you know? Mm -hmm. But a political uh, organization around us can make laws for the common good about something even like that, a traffic law. 
So it's good for us to obey traffic laws because that's in Christian charity, we are interested in protecting the people around us. There's a concept called natural law, Mm -hmm. which we've talked about in the podcast many times. But I think sometimes, you know, good Christians think about, you know, biblical, Mm. uh, you know, what is this biblical? Is this scripturally based? Uh, Even there's a term sometimes used in Christian circles, biblical law. Of Mm. course, that's, you know, different in the Old Testament versus Mm. what Jesus shares in the New Testament and what he does in the New Testament. What is natural law? What is what is its implications for Christians? Natural law would be in the most generic imposition of that term. It would be the the law that comes along with our human nature, along with the laws of nature. So sometimes that overlaps also with revealed law. Uh, The the great doctors of the church, the great theologians, um, like St. Thomas Aquinas, who's of course preeminent among them, but also the ancient fathers, St. Augustine and and St. Jerome and and um, also the Greek fathers, they, they have an understanding that, let's say the 10 commandments revealed by God in the old covenant those are also things we can know if we understand human nature. The, the fact that we must um, give all of our obedience and love to God, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. That's also, even though that's revealed by God on Mount Sinai in the Ten Commandments, it's also something we can know with our human reason if we understand what is human nature. We are creatures subject to a creator, which means that we owe him our love and obedience and that we should have no gods before him. So that's a natural law that has also become revealed law. And the reason why God revealed the Ten Commandments to us is because because we're weak, fallen creatures with with clouded intellects, and we need help. Even though we can know a lot about the natural law, we're probably not going to get there, all of us, because of our clouded intellects fallen, darkened by sin. So God then, in his mercy, revealed to us these truths, which are also part of the natural law. So uh, that's a long way of saying what's, what we can know about uh, human nature can tell us what our natural rights are or what, what the natural law is. And then also God helps us with, re- with revelation, scriptural re- revelation. And that's why we're going to find in other cultures these gems of truth that are uh, you, you see in the Ten Commandments that Absolutely. are divine revelation given to us by God yes. directly, you know, literally on the mount with a, the with a tablet and you have it written there. But then you're saying you can actually come to those conclusions that these are laws of how we should live using our reason right. based on the natural world and based on how we behave naturally as human beings and our tendencies and inclinations and our ability to have freedom and choose. A great example of that is what is marriage? It's a perfect example of this. Every culture knows that marriage is is a union of one man and one woman. That's something that is comes with our nature. It's for the procreation and education of children. That's why it exists. We, if you understand what is a human being, we see by our biology that it's necessary for one man and one woman to come together in a, in this natural union, which is marriage, so that the human race can be propagated. And also so that those offspring can be, um, can grow and be educated in a society, which is the family. That's true for all time. It's true in every culture and every religion that's, the, that's a true religion. That's something that is built into our human nature. So the natural law shows us that that's what marriage has to be. And it's the only thing it can be. Now, of course, there's a huge amount of debate about that in, in <laughs> the post-Christian and post-modern world that we live in. But that's a good example of, of um, something that we can know by human nature, which is pointing to a natural law. Quick side question on that, on that which I think is a, a debate, but I, I think you'll have a great answer. Polygamy has sometimes mm-hmm. been defended by saying, well, it actually is in the natural order mm-hmm. for there to be polygamy, meaning one man and multiple women, mm-hmm. um, not polygyny, I think would be, is that the one? Polyandry, I think. Is that, is uh, one, it, yeah, woman, one woman, multiple and many husbands, men. yes. So the idea is it's natural for a man to have multiple women, not the other way around, because women obviously carry children and men can have multiple wives at the same time. And so therefore polygamy is part of the natural order. Did you know that every year 200,000 families go bankrupt 
from medical bills, even with health insurance. For many people, insurance is simply not working for them. That's why I'm excited to share with you about Crowd Health, which is an alternative model for paying for your health care. Crowd Health takes your bills, personally negotiates them on your behalf, and then sends out a request to the community to help cover your bills. The Crowd Health community has fully funded more than 5,000 medical bills over the last two years. This includes accidents like a young woman in Tennessee who lost her fingers in a boating accident to NICU babies and cancer cases. Keep in mind, Crowd Health is not the same thing as insurance, but it is an alternative model to help pay medical bills and keep your monthly costs low. So go to Join Crowd Health today. Use the code Lila at checkout to get your first three months for only $99. That's joincrowdhealth.com and use the code Lila at checkout to get your first three months for only $99. Joincrowdhealth.com. This is where now scriptural revelation helps us an awful lot. So in the Garden of Eden, there was one man and one woman who were the father and mother of the whole human race. And uh, after the fall in original sin, then a great deal of confusion and darkness entered into our human race because of our fallen nature. So then it then because of fallen human nature, it's not mm -hmm. obvious to our sinful condition that one man and one woman is the best way forward or the only way forward. So we even see that that God very gradually led his people into the understanding that marriage is again between one man and one woman and not one man and many women, many wives. Because because of our fallen nature, it seems like that could be a way to organize family life. Again, for the propagation of the race, for the multiplication of the, the growth of the human race with, with many women and one father to sire many children. So God had gradually to lead his people out of that into a correct understanding of marriage, just like he had to lead his people gradually out of idolatry mm -hmm out of the land of Egypt. And, and it was a, with great effort. Um, in fact, his people were always falling back into the sin of idolatry, even right after the revelation of the Ten Commandments. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. The golden calf. So God is very gentle in guiding us out of that darkness and error into the fullness of truth, which is exactly what happens from the old covenant into the new covenant of love of our Lord Jesus Christ. The difference between um, the Ten Commandments and all of the laws of the Old Covenant, and then our Lord giving the, fulfill, the, the fullness of that in the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. I think it's a great answer. I, I've heard it said, too, that the reason you can reason your way to monogamy, one mm. man, one woman, is because it's a matter of justice mm. to the children. Mm as well as to the spouse, as particularly the woman, you know, to have one devoted husband and one devoted father, that they do, there's not favoritism between the different families within the family, uh, yes. potentially. And so it's a matter of justice. Yes. And that's why you can reason your way to the concept of monogamy. It yes. doesn't just come from divine revelation, but that's exactly what you're saying earlier, which is that these things God has given us as divine revelation to help us with our clouded intellects. But yes. when you take a step back and you use your reason, you can also see the reason, the Correct. natural order behind these uh, Correct. Behind, behind these commands. It makes perfect sense. And why is that, Lila? Because the truth is one. The truth is the truth wherever we find it. And it, it, it comes from God. Um, our Lord Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And, and truth is one so if we if we come to know the truth because of mm. the natural light of the human intellect mm. we're arriving at truth if we come to the truth because god reveals it to us through scriptural revelation ultimately through the incarnation of his son and then again and then through the church which christ instituted it's still the truth the truth cannot contradict itself Amen. What a, what a comfort that that's the case. Yeah, praise God. Okay, so there's these uh, these core principles about our civic life and this mm. whole project of government that I think are very powerful. You're going to actually be coming out with a special series about this uh, yes. at St. Michael's on the, the website. How people how will people be able to access this? Okay, so we have on the Abbot Circle, which is our virtual monastery, this wonderful uh, platform mm. that has uh, a little window into all of uh, our abbeys. Uh, life, prayer, liturgy, formation, intellectual formation, art and music, and all kinds of great things, theabbotcircle.com. We've been doing a series over the last several years called Five Things Every Catholic Should Know and about different topics. So this is Five Things Every Catholic Should Know, political edition. Awesome. So 
And this is not, I mean, I, I think, yes, of course, Catholics are going to glean from this. We have a lot of uh, non-Catholics who listen to the show, a lot of evangelicals, Protestants, mm. people who are not even religious. I think these principles are not just for Catholics per se. These well, are yeah, correct. Yeah. Because the truth is one. So so these are true principles about about how we can understand our place in civic society as believers. And because the Catholic Church is the fullness of Christian truth, <laughs> of course, mm -hmm. it's also going to apply. It will apply to Christians of other denominations. So this the, the truth is one. Awesome. And um, Father Hugh and I, Father Hugh is a very, very intelligent, wonderful uh, theologian, philosopher. He's one of the most intelligent men I've ever met. And he and I mm -hmm. have five conversations about these points. So that's something that people might be interested in. It's not going to tell you how to cast your vote at mm -hmm. when you get into the ballot or to the, into the ballot box on election day. But hopefully this series will help people form their consciences so they can understand their civic responsibility better. Wonderful. So what I want to do is go to some of these hot button uh, okay. questions about how we are supposed to show up for each other in political life and in okay. civic life. One of them has to do with this idea of the common good. And you address this obviously in your series too. But how how we are to think about the needs of our neighbors. Yes. This is, of course, important for Christians because we are actually commanded to love our neighbor as ourself, and we're commanded to see the Jesus Christ in the least of these. So there's a lot in the Christian social teaching that is directly scriptural, goes in, going back to the words of our Lord about how we're supposed to treat other people, especially those that are in need. Mm, mm. In political, in the political world, in government, what does that mean then okay. for the role of government in serving the needy and in helping provide for the welfare of those that are in need? Would love you to unpack okay. that. Great. That's a lot of that's a lot of topics kind of piled into one big question. So maybe we can uh, dive into that with just what is the common good? The Catechism of the Catholic Church. This is number nineteen hundred and six. Says by common good is to be understood the sum total of social conditions which allow people, either as groups or as individuals, to reach their fulfillment more fully and more easily. Beautiful. Okay, so that's that's a pretty good definition. I love that. Reach their fulfillment more... More fully and more easily. Beautiful. So the fulfillment of our human nature, the fulfillment of um, what it means to be people who love one another. So our purpose. Yeah. Beautiful. Ful fulfill the potential, to actualize the potential of what it means to be a human person. So that's what a common good is, the sum total of the social conditions which allow people, either as groups or as individuals, to reach their fulfillment. So the big question is, what is the role of government yes. in achieving that? Okay, so the first, um, like I said a little while ago, whenever you put two people together, you're going to have some governmental arrangement. You know, mm -hmm. society begins with a couple or a family. The family unit is the first instantiation of a government and of course every family figures out how does the father and the mother how do they collaborate what what responsibilities do they undertake for the good of their children for the good of each other so that's a kind of a little government right there in fam in a family in a household and there are then concentric circles that go around that uh, because it, beca it becomes obvious that one family probably isn't going to be able to provide for everything their children will need? Where the Where is the food going to come from? Where is the education going to come from? So families get together, maybe in a little village originally, or in a little township or something, and they collaborate. You know, well, we'll have a schoolhouse, and we'll put all of our children in the schoolhouse, and the moms or the dads will teach them. We'll do that corporately. Or we'll get together and we'll, we'll run the farms around the village so that we can share the food. Or that, I mean, even... The hunter-gatherers would go and they'd go on a hunt together and then share the spoils of their hunt, right? Okay, so family to a group of families to, in, in the contemporary world, a town, a state, and in our country, the whole country then. These are all um, governmental arrangements which have a view toward a common good. Wonderful. So let's go to the question of welfare then okay if you are creating these concentric circles let's say uh of these families and we have this and you know different people have different roles within the community economically or yes. for caring for children or for caring for the community to make it orderly you know law enforcement all these different roles there's 
inevitably because of our fallen nature mm. and just because of natural the natural order having problems you know there can be a natural human disaster weakness, human all kinds weakness. of things right there's going to be problems for some people there's mm. going to be poverty that they're experiencing illness so when our neighbor or people in our community are suffering mm. then it's the role i think of the community to try to help that person mm -hmm. generally speaking what does that look like though for government versus say private entities or you know the, the family individually or other structures nonprofits you know, non-governmental organizations to serve the, the the needs of people. Of course, we're tiptoeing here into the big questions that are debated, you know, nationally right now, yes. frequently about yes. what is the role of government when it comes to welfare yes. versus the private sector. Yes. Okay. So uh, stepping back from the particulars for a minute, it it's true, just as you said, because of our fallen human nature, we're going to find people on the margins in biblical language, that's the widow and the orphan, and also the alien. So people who are from outside of the community who are needing assistance, but also widows and orphans, the people who fall off the edges of the ordin ordinary organization of human society. What do we do for them? One of the, the most beautiful revelations of God's love for us through the old covenant and the new is that we don't let those people fall off the edges. We care for one another and we love one another. We value human life. And in fact, our Lord Jesus says, how are we going to be judged? We're going to be judged on how good a job we do of that. Whatever you did for the least of these, my brethren, you did it f for me. You did it for me. Mother Teresa, the famous you know, champion of service to the poor, she says that was the gospel on five fingers. You did it for me. This is how we will be judged as Christians when we meet our Savior at the end of our life. Did you care for those little ones? Were you mindful of those who fall off the edges of, of society? Did you care for the poor? It's a really, so what do we do? So that's the, the big, beautiful biblical revelation part of that. How does that trickle down into an actual governmental arrangement? Well. The common good also has to account for that, for the people who fall off the edges somehow and need assistance. So there is a kind of sense of, we must share our resources with those who are less um, privileged and whatever that means. That might mean, you know, in Christendom, in the, in the age of faith, the monasteries would be places where poor people could come and they would be fed and even housed for free. Mm -hmm. It was a real Christian society where um, the monastery is the economic epicenter. All of the agriculture revolves around it. Food comes from there for the whole village. And um, the widows, orphans, and the, um, and the alien, the stranger, would be able to, be, to receive hmm. the resources, their resources there too. So the big question for us in a, in a government like ours is, where does that get excessive and what does the right of the individual, what, what do the individuals have by way of being able to keep their own resources rather than just, you know, we're not, we're not um, a socialist state where everything is pooled and no one has their own um, autonomy. And the reason for that is and there's another principle about the subsidiarity okay. for why we're not just a socialist state, why we don't just hand over all of our goods Yes. And belongings to a higher power to then redistribute them. There's, yes. a, there's, a, there's actually a, a reason for that, not just it's not just a political theory, but it's actually a Christian principle why we don't do that. Right. So the, and that has everything to do with human freedom and the dignity and autonomy of the individual. So um, the most important thing in a Christian society is not economic equality. It's, that's just that's not a biblical principle that um, while we are called to share with those who are less fortunate than we are, we're not called to make everybody perfectly equal in what they're able to accomplish by way of fulfilling their own human dignity. And why? Why is that? Because God made people differently, mm. that there is a hierarchy of skills, talents, resources, you know, the, someone might be a really great farmer and somebody else might be a really great doctor or lawyer. Someone might be a really great homemaker. Those people are different. And where there is difference, there is hierarchy. And so we shouldn't expect the farmer 
to act like the homemaker or to have the same lifestyle or uh, even hopes and dreams as as the lawyer or the school teacher. So God made people differently. And that means that people have different kinds of um, fulfillment to pursue, that they will be pursuing different goals. And that will also come with different either economic benefits or societal contributions. So people are different. I, I love that. But I think there is some confusion, not among most Christians today, but certainly among some because there is in the book of Acts these, mm. you know, arrangements that the early Christians had with each other where yes. they did turn over their property and their My belongings. way of life is a good example of that actually. You're, ex there you go. I live that's, in a I live in a yeah. I live a lifestyle that is directly uh, a direct um, reference mm. to the book of Acts. They held mm. all things in common and each was given according to his needs. And so we, I have a vow of poverty for this reason, that I live in a monastery of consecrated men. We pool our resources. I have no ownership. Um, we, we hold all things in common. It really is an apostolic lifestyle. Now, that's, I do that freely of my own choice. I profess a vow to do that. But, but there's, not, there's no sense in which the government can command that of somebody because that would be to eliminate their autonomy. I can choose to pool my resources in a monastic community and make a professive vow of poverty. You don't profess a vow of poverty. You have a mm -hmm. career and you have a family of your own. You have your own bank accounts and your own property. And that is very much in the service of God and his kingdom. And you don't, mm -hmm. there's no sense in which everybody has to surrender their individual rights in this way or their autonomy uh, in order to live in this collective kind of a way, this apostolic kind of a way. Wasn't there a scene though in Acts, again, just to um, play devil's advocate a little bit for those that have wrestled with this concept, there was a scene where they were they they, they were punished for- Ananias and Sapphira. Significantly. Yes. I mean, there was a- there they, was were, a they were struck They dead. were killed. They <laughs> yes, were killed they were. <laughs> for withholding- That's right. They, they, their free will, you know, so they yes. there was compulsion happening they, at that they, time you could and Ananias and Sapphira were struck dead because they had agreed to live in this okay this so you're highly saying there wasn't compulsion way. they had agreed but then they lied something like that okay yes there and so There's because the because they had um they had not fulfilled the project they that they committed to mm. then God used them as an example of no vows mean something and, and our choices matter. And if we're going to commit to a common good in this particular kind of a way, like the apostolic life in common that now Christian monasteries represent, well then, you, you, when you profess a vow, you should keep it, the Psalms say, you know? So that would be akin to, you know, a Norbertine secretly compiling a treasure chest of, yes. <laughs> of jewels in the back room or something. And, and not to say God would strike him dead today, but it was more of a weighing the importance, showing the importance of keeping one's vows. I think something like that. Was that was the yes. lesson there. Yes. Okay. A big thank you to our sponsor, GoodRanchers.com. Good Ranchers is American meat delivered. Did you know that up to 90% of the meat in your grocery store is not from the United States? It might say USA on the label, but it's not actually from American Ranchers. It's imported and packaged in the United States. Good Ranchers is 100% sourced from the United States. And when you choose GoodRanchers.com, you're choosing more than just delicious meat. You're choosing to support local American farms and ranchers, standing up for transparency and safety in our food supply. At my house, chicken nuggets are an easy and kid-friendly meal, but I'm concerned about the seed oils and the additives in the brands that we purchase at the grocery store. Thankfully, Good Ranchers has created a new seed oil-free nugget. No other nugget on the market offers a pure seed oil-free recipe that prioritizes your family's health without sacrificing flavor or crunch. And right now, if you subscribe at GoodRanchers.com for a limited time, you can get a free add-on for a full four years or until the next presidential election. That means that when you subscribe to any of the Good Ranchers boxes, you get to decide if you want free chicken breast, Angus ground beef, applewood smoked bacon, or wild caught salmon in every one of your orders for four years. So go to GoodRanchers.com today. Use my code Lila at checkout to get up to $1,200 of free add-ons. That's GoodRanchers.com, American Meat Delivered. 
So, so for the Christian today, I think a lot of Christians look at today's political system and what they're and and one of the things that they're weighing or trying to discern is you have you know one party, the Democrats, who are typically seen as giving more direct social assistance, mm-hmm. welfare assistance to the poor, and then the Republican Party, which is more seen as well the best the best way to help the poor is to let there be more freedom economically, and you know people own more of what they earn as mm-hmm. opposed to having to hand it to the government for redistribution, and that in the end is going to uh, lift up the poor more. And then there are these two competing maybe policy offerings, right? Yes. What is the what is the uh, Christian teaching on how to think about these different policy approaches. Are they both moral? Are they both fine? And it's just a matter of prudence to determine which one we think makes more sense and actually works in real life. Okay, I, th- yeah, it's a very, it's a really good question. I want, I'm going to scroll through my notes here and find the part that I want to talk about um, about some of these priorities, some of these priorities and how we arrange government. Okay, so there are. It, it would be very difficult to impose a kind of clear Christian moral overlay onto what we live in in a bipartisan mm-hmm. governmental arrangement of Democratic Party and the Republican Party. There are parts of both of those, especially historically, which are better representative of the Christian perspective on civic life. So for example, historically speaking, and I think we could debate whether or not this is still true, the, the Democratic Party was always more solicitous for the welfare of the less fortunate. Um, that goes all the way back to even the forming of of um, trade of labor unions and so forth. That there's a way that we want to be sure that employees are compensated correctly, that the marginalized are attended to, that people don't slip through the cracks. And there's something beautiful about that that we could say, I can see gospel principles there. That's not maybe why they're doing it, but I can see there's something there that is about the widow and the orphan, figuratively speaking. Whereas you could say, well, the more um, historically Republican perspective is we need to empower the individual to be able to fulfill their potential economically, in their uh, careers, uh, for the autonomy of how they want to arrange their family life and educate their children. So much more, um, much better uh, uh, building the economic resources of our whole country and the, the corporate world that can also then distribute from that the the help for the poor, for example. So there's something beautiful and Christian about that too, because it's about the autonomy and dignity of of people and their work and their family and their rights and so forth. What do we do when we don't see a Christian party? What do we do? We have to assess what are the priorities that we're going to assess what, who's doing a better job of that. Okay, so I want to just, again, some some principles about what are the most important things in um to consider when voting yes what are the non-negotiables what are the non-negotiables okay so here's one this is a this is and and we we, it would be remiss not to say this it's very controversial of course but yes of course the holy father pope francis came out and i know obviously a lot of folks listening to the show who have a lot of opinions about the pope good and bad um and of course everyone's entitled to to an opinion about this but pope francis came out and he wasn't speaking you know ex cathedra he was speaking i think more off the cuff in, I think it was a media format interview. I don't know the exact format, but he was sharing, he was asked how should Americans vote in this election? Mm-hmm. You know, let's ask the Pope. And he didn't tell you how to vote, but he did say, well, it's tough basically. And he said that you can vote for the lesser of two evils. And then he went as far as explaining, he thought that the Republicans position on, or the threat that, you know, President Trump has made to do mass deportations. Uh, and sort of his posture towards um, immigrants. He considered that an evil. And then, of course, Kamala Harris's rabid support for abortion is Mm. a horrific evil. He called that out. And he was saying it's tough because these are both evils and you have to weigh the lesser of two evils. Okay. Um, I'm glad you brought up that example, Lila, because in a way it touches on these priorities. Again, let's remember we're talking about this is all under the umbrella of the common good. Political arrangements are about pursuing a common good. What are the non-negotiables in the pursuit of the common good? Pope Benedict XVI, this is back in 2006, he gave us some good guidelines, relatively contemporary guidelines about this, although he was just repeating what has been the longstanding tradition of the church for many, many um, decades already. He said that a non-negotiable is the protection of life in all its stages from the first moment of conception until natural death. 
That is a non-negotiable. Now, of course, we're in a situation where neither party believes that or represents that. Mm -hmm. So we're in a, in a pickle as far as how to cast a ballot. But again, the big picture, what are the non-negotiables? So protection of life in all its stages, that's non-negotiable. If, his, if it's going to be a, an authentic pursuit of the common good, that's one. There are three. Of them. And, and I want to get to the other one, but a quick side note there. Historically, at least in recent history, the Republican Party has been more so. More so. I mean, the platform has been 100% pro life, and the Democrat platform has been 100% for abortion. So that yeah. was a very clear distinction when you're weighing this top issue of life and the protection of innocent life. It was, from in a way, murder. an obvious way to be able to assess how I'm going to cast my ballot. And it's been a little bit clouded recently, yes, more alas. than a little bit, unfortunately, because that was removed from the Republican plank. Now, I do think it's clear that the policy positions of the Republicans at large on abortion are much more restrictive right. than the Democrats. I think That's that correct. is an obvious fact, but there is still a lot of abortions that are being permitted under, unfortunately, re re the Republican platform. Yes. Uh, not as many, though, under the uh, uh, Democrat. I, I do have one other question, though. You mentioned you t used the term protection of life mm -hmm. from natural from conception until natural death. What is just just how, how remind us what is the role of government in the protection of life? Because that could mean a lot of things. Protecting yes. one, like I I get on the freeway and I'm driving, I in, it could potentially be endangering my life by a car accident. Of course, we'll try to drive safely. You know, my life is maybe protected because the government's telling me to wear a seatbelt, has a speed limit. But it's more than that. It's also my right to not be killed, to that's, be murdered. That's so especially what it means is that the that the right to exist, the right to exist, that the the value of every human life and its right to exist. That's especially what we mean by protecting there, that that it would be immoral for any government to restrict someone's or take away someone's right to exist, which is what abortion is and which is what euthanasia is. So th that that is about especially existence. And then, of course, that, again, circles out into traffic laws and everything else, which is remote, remotely related to the right to exist. There are a number of critics of the, I would say, anti-abortion position who say, well, we're pro-life because we provide more social services mm. through the government to those that are in need to actually help people live. And so it's not enough to just let them be born, help them live. And therefore, this is sometimes an argument where they, again, it's a bit of a, um, you know, doing a lot of, uh, jumping through a lot of hoops to get here. But they basically are saying, you can be in support of someone who is pro-abortion if they have all of these other policies that are going to help people once they're born, because that's going to limit the number of abortions people may choose to have. I'm mm. thinking about Beto O'Rourke, who was running in Texas, mm. and there were some Catholics at the time who were coming out in support of yeah. him because he was so pro-social services, even though he was extremely pro-killing babies in the womb. Yeah, it's a that's a, just a moral fallacy that it that that is a. Um, a proportionalism, which is an erroneous moral principle that because there's all these other circumstances that look like they're pro-woman or pro-life, then I can consent to voting for someone who is rabidly pro-death in abortion. That's just, that's just not true. Um, that would be the ends justifying a means. And it's just not true. It's, it's just wrong. It's ethically not tenable. So it's an easy one. Mm -hmm. Again, the rhetoric makes it very appealing but people who don't have a well-formed conscience can very fall, easily fall prey to that because those other things, the welfare state support of you know, the education of um, poor children or social services, those are further down the list of priorities. The right to exist, the right to life is the top one. It's non-negotiable. How the, how the other things down below, those could be negotiable. Um, okay, I want to just... Uh, Two other non-negotiables. Non non <laughs> we talked about the first mm -hmm. one. The second one, recognition and promotion of the natural structure of the family as a union between a man and a woman based on marriage. Mm -hmm. We talked about the beginning of this podcast. That is a non-negotiable. What is marriage? The, the, the civic order, the mm -hmm. state, even the Supreme Court can try to redefine it. It doesn't change the nature of the thing. Marriage is the union between one man and one woman for the procreation and education of children and for the sanctification of the spouses. That's what it always has been. That's what it always will be. 
and no law can change that fact. That's just a fact. That's a non-negotiable. The third one is the protection of the right of parents to educate their children. So parents are the, they have the first say over what happens in the lives of their children. The state cannot take that away from parents. So those are three non-negotiables. Now, everything else then it, below that, you could say, well, what do we think about immigrants? What do we think about our country's borders? What do we think about foreign policy? What do we think about economics? There can be a lot of debate about that. We might say they're negotiable in light of those non-negotiables. So I, that, that makes it a little bit clearer about assessing the um, not perfectly aligned parties, not, that is parties that are not perfectly aligned with Christian principles. How do I sort out where, where I'm going to cast my vote? Oh, well, and I think those are such useful principles because even this idea of the right to exist, obviously if you're using you know, violent force against immigrants as just an example, theoretically, if this mm -hmm. were to happen, that we were you know, infringing- Rounding their, them up and- Yeah, and, horrible yeah, things, whatever. infringing on their right to exist themselves and, and killing them, right? right? That would violate that first principle in just the same way that abortion does. Correct. And so we could vote against that. So I, I think where things get, the lines get blurred for people and there's confusion that enters in is that we forget these first three principles. And so then we start to think about maybe the economic uh, you know, treatment or the economic, uh, you know, how people are doing economically, like this migrant, this poor migrant who's fleeing their country and the economic conditions there, or maybe they're fleeing political violence. And so mm -hmm. they're coming here seeking asylum. And so what about, you know, there's kind of the case for them from, I would say the left just stereotypically is that, well, they're, you know, what about their plight? Mm -hmm. Even that plight as significant as it is, and as much as it warrants our concern, when you were to, if we had to contrast it with the plight of another person who's literally going to be executed. Yes. We, so there's a difference, there's a difference in that degree of their plight. Correct. The priorities, the, if, if again, under the light of what is the common good and those concentric circles of understanding that common good from the family out to the village, to the state, to the nation, the, the immigrant, um, refugee coming from outside of the country of course, it would be reasonable for a society to say, well, we want to share our resources with them insofar as that's possible, only as long as it's not taking away from the good of the citizens, because the responsibility of the government is for this group of people. A nation is a real thing with a geographic boundary, and the people who are citizens of it are members of it. The, the needy person outside of it doesn't have a right to the resources of that country but that country has a certain responsibility to consider them. Does that make sense? Yes. So, but they also have the right to seek help. Absolutely. That doesn't mean they That's have right. the right to receive the exact help that they may seek from a particular party or entity. And that's Correct. where it gets complicated, of That's course. right. So that's why these priorities about what common good is it, what aspect of the common good is in view is really important. And people get very confused about this because of all the rhetoric. You see the, you know, the figurative suffering refugee, of course your heart goes out to that person, and it should. We, we want to lift up the poor. And yet, if that's happened to such a degree that the, the good of the citizens of the country are, um, are really, really suffering for it, well then, maybe there has to be a, a different arrangement of, of the, those values. Do a you, balance of those values. I should, do I you say. think we, we did have Jimmy Aiken? It was a very controversial episode to, on here to talk about the Holy Father and you know whatever you're comfortable sharing here. But I I do wonder if because again the media world we can receive you know off the cuff comments mm. from the Holy Father given to a reporter who then blasts them to the world. So the amount of commentary we hear mm. from a Pope is mm. more than ever before in human history. Historically, when the Pope had something to say to the world, it would be via a letter mm -hmm. that would be shared across Christendom or across you know, the, wh whatever yeah, area. Disseminated through the bishops. Yeah, disseminated through the bishops. Now we hear it directly on mm -hmm. a video, you know, right. that from, from, a, from an off-the-cuff conversation, or maybe not even off-the-cuff, a prepared conversation, but nonetheless not in that format. Right. And so do you think that, to, you know, I'm just going back to the, what the Holy Father was saying about the, the plight of immigrants versus the plight of unborn children. You know, I, I listen to that and I think, you know, clearly there's a plight that many immigrants face, especially those that are seeking asylum, that are escaping some sort of danger or some sort of harm to their life. But 
children being killed by abortion, there's 3,000 of these happening right. a day, and it's legal. Right. There's no comparison in terms of the Correct. the scope of the problem and the, the severity of the problem. I mean, you're actually killing children, and it's legal. Now, that's when you're comparing these issues. How that then um, plays with our current candidates is another question, because right. that's, that's, there's complications there, and we'll, we'll talk about that. But uh, what 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 is your take on that? Do you think when the Holy Father says this, I know we can't get in his mind or his heart, um, well, first of all, he's not speaking on matter of faith and morals for the whole correct, church correct. per se. So we don't have to take it as infallibility. This That's is correct. infallible. It's not, it's not an infallible statement. That's correct. But right. do you think there's another, just any advice you have for people, Christians and non-Christians alike, Catholics and non-Catholics alike, when they hear these comments from the Holy Father, how to be thinking about them? Yes. Especially when they have to do with these political controversial issues. Do you want to enjoy the most delicious cup of coffee that you've ever had in your life? then you've got to check out sevenweekscoffee.com. I love a Seven Weeks Coffee because this is a company that sources their beans ethically from the top one to 2% of all coffee beans in the world. They also have direct relationships through fair trade with the coffee farmers so you can get the most high quality roasts. Sevenweekscoffee.com is also low acid, gourmet, small batch roasted coffee that is always fresh and is delivered right to your door. My favorite thing though about sevenweekscoffee.com isn't just that it's the most delicious cup of coffee that you're going to drink, but that Seven Weeks Coffee donates 10% of all of their revenue, not just their profits, directly to pregnancy resource centers to help moms and babies in need. In fact, sevenweekscoffee.com has given over half of a million dollars because of your purchases directly to help moms and babies in need through pregnancy resource centers. So go to sevenweekscoffee.com today. You can use the code Lila at checkout and you can get up to 25% off your first order by joining the Heartbeat Club. The Heartbeat Club is your special coffee subscription club that you get fresh coffee delivered right to your door. And by joining the club, you are donating to your pregnancy resource center of choice to help moms and babies in need. I recommend you check out the Ethiopian medium roast. That is my favorite. I've had friends tell me that the Hope Roast is their favorite. There's all kinds that you can pick from dark, medium, light. They've even got the decaf roast. Use the code Lila at checkout for up to 25% off your order. Drink the most delicious cup of coffee you've ever had and help save lives while you're doing it at sevenweekscoffee.com. Well, I think we have to see, um, you know, the, the whole world has always, since our Lord ascended into heaven and left, left the church with his apostles under the guidance of St. Peter, the prince of the apostles, and, and the first among equals amongst the apostolic college, that the world has always looked at the, the Catholic church as a um, guide in moral matters. She represents the the best and clearest although broken historically sometimes really complicated um guiding star of of how should we think about all kinds of things in life um and under the light of christ and so it's good for people to listen to what the pope says about whatever he's just a man and he's not speaking authoritatively on matters of faith and morals in a in, a, in an interview on a plane or wherever else but it there's a good respectful way to say, well, what, what does that, how can what he says shape the way I think about my life in politics? I need to be mindful of the poor. And I also need to uphold the dignity of human life from, from the moment of conception until natural death. Those are both true things. Like I said, a non-negotiable is the right to exist, the right to life. That's a non-negotiable. The care of people outside of the country refugees, immigrants, the needy, th those are negotiable in the sense that we can, we can disagree about what that should look like. We can't disagree about the fact that abortion is wicked and should be abolished. It's black and white. The black baby's and white. dead or alive. That's a non-negotiable. We can, we can have disagreements about what a border should look like, how many people should be able to come through it. If we have illegal immigrants here, what we should do with them should we send them back to their home countries if they're not really needy refugees fleeing political violence? Governments can disagree about that. Parties can disagree about that. Catholics and Christians can disagree about those. They can't disagree about the right to life. That's a non-negotiable. So when a Holy Father says those two things together, we have to have the right priorities in mind. Such a, such a good point, Father. And I think that distinction, we, we can't, 
I don't think it's possible to make that distinction too many times. Because That's in right. political discourse today and in, in, in the media, you get such a disproportionate amount of focus on anyone but the unborn child. Right. You they're think, not I'm, getting any headlines, and they're the ones that are being murdered. I'm going to say something really radical, Lila, that you're, you're, some of your viewers might not even agree with. Even in the cases of rape and incest, the baby's not, the, not at fault. Even if all of the circumstances in the conception of that child are wrong, 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 why does that baby need to lose his life because of it? That baby has a right to life no matter how he or she was conceived, under what circumstances. There are no exceptions. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just, I'm not sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm delighted to be able to, to preach that truth. We have to proclaim it from the rooftops. So when we're, when we're debating over, is it going to be 12 weeks or 16 weeks? Is it first trimester or you know, fourth trimester, <laughs> ridiculous. So um, I sometimes think, I wonder why God hasn't wiped our country off the face of the earth. We kill so many babies. I got it's a it. mystery to me, really. It's a, it's a chilling thought that you just shared. And I, I, I was texting with a friend about this recently, a very wise friend, and they were saying this was attributed to Mother Teresa, but I don't know that she actually said this, but the price, the consequence for abortion will be nuclear war mm. was this comment that was attributed to Mother Teresa. But she had a lot to say about abortion. I'm not sure she said that exactly, but it is a chilling thought because I mean, when, of the when sheer you, when, amount of bloodshed. When you really think about what this slaughter of the innocents is, I, d I just don't see how anybody can be debating uh, all of the negotiable things down the ballot when this is so obviously uh, a non-negotiable. In any case, I mean, that's... We, you, like you said, we have to just keep saying that over and over and over again. We have to break through the rhetoric and, and, and change hearts. We have to change hearts. We have to pray that, that God will change hearts, that the grace of Jesus Christ will change hearts. We, so. we talked before this interview about getting into the thorny question of how to vote this mm -hmm. November. And I was saying, well, I don't know if we will get into it today. We'll see. Maybe we'll, we'll touch on it lately, but I think we're just going to go for it with the time we have left, Father, because... <laughs> okay. uh, it is very connected to what you're talking about now, what we're discussing, the lesser of two evils question. And, you know, what is the best way to be a good citizen? I would not say the number one best way to be a good citizen is to vote. I think there's a thousand other things that being a good citizen entails. Voting is most of the time, though, included in that. You know, we should, generally speaking, vote. Yes. Um, you and I were discussing before this, uh, we sat down to have this interview about the question whether one must always vote okay. and what it looks like when perhaps there's an election where you have two truly bad op uh, options and your act of refusing to vote may help one or the other win right. based on what party you're typically aligned with right. can help send a message to the party uh, that they need to change course and not continue in whatever bad direction they're going if they want your vote in the future. Okay. So that is a case that I haven't made exactly as such, but that is a case that some are making right now because of recent movements and which, you know, we get into this on the show all the time by the Republican Party to soften their platform on abortion. Now they are for abortion in the first trimester and into the second. The Republican Party, the, the Republican ticket, I should say, um, thinks that, you know, California has the, should have the freedom to legalize abortion up until birth, that that mm -hmm. is the right of California to do, uh, that, you know, abortion pills are permissible and should be supported, actually. Access to mm -hmm. them should be supported, even to the point where our current Republican ticket on abortion has said that they are critical of pro-life laws, even pro-life laws that are not complete, like mm -hmm. the heartbeat mm -hmm. law in mm -hmm. Florida mm -hmm. doesn't even protect babies before six or seven weeks, so it still allows the killing of human lives. Mm -hmm but saying that that doesn't allow the killing of enough human lives, we should allow several more weeks. Uh, and mm -hmm. then certainly we should allow rape, incest, you know, any other, you know, kind of condition that would indicate a doctor might want to do an abortion that should be permissible. So it's a pretty dramatic change from right. the last four decades of the Republican platform on abortion, which right. has been very solid, 100% pro-life. Right. So a lot of Christians, good people are wrestling with this. Now, 
the Democrat side is clearly for even more abortion than that through right. all nine months. And they have been for decades. They want to kill so, babies. They love to kill babies. I mean, there is there <laughs> seems to be this attitude that has complete disregard for the life in the womb to the point yeah. that abortion for any reason at any time is acceptable. But now we're dealing with this other yeah. challenge with an, the other party in our effectively two-party system, although there are other parties. That's true. <laughs> they, they do exist, and you can't. There is an opportunity to write in on the ballot. So what's your what's your take on okay, this, Okay, it's a Father? big, it's, again, a lot of, a, a lot I know, there's a lot. There's I always a lot throw in that. a lot, I want to back, I want to back all the way up to, should we vote? Do we have an obligation to vote? I think that, that, was, that begins with that question. Yes. Always. Does, do we always do we, have Okay, so Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 2240. Submission to authority and co-responsibility for the common good make it moral, morally obligatory to pay taxes, to exercise the right to vote, and to defend one's country. Morally obligatory to pay taxes, to exercise the right to vote, to exercise the right to vote, and to defend one's country. Okay. That was, yeah, is now, exercising the right to exactly. vote Exactly. So that's so we have to dig into that a little bit more. So <laughs> let's see. Um, it's sinful to vote for the enemies of religion or liberty except to exclude a worse candidate or unless compelled by fear of great personal harm relatively greater than the public harm at stake. It's sinful to vote for enemies of religion or liberty except to exclude a worse candidate. That's the question of the lesser two evils. Okay, so there's no absolute moral obligation to vote. Uh, but in times of, I just have some notes that I wrote, mm -hmm. but in times of serious crisis, the obligation becomes more serious. Mm -hmm. We simply, we can't simply opt out at all. And a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of people do that. Like, I don't want to get into it. Mm -hmm. I don't want to study the issue. I don't want to inform myself. I don't want to form my conscience. And if I if I may interrupt there, I think that's such a good point. And just to rest on that for a moment, you're saying in moments of crisis, it's important to exercise their right to vote and to not opt out. Now, it, you could make the argument if someone has a larger strategy mm -hmm. of what and why they're doing, instead right. of just saying, it's too complicated, it's too messy, I hate politics, I'm not going to deal with this. Right, right? I don't want to be bothered. I'm going to wake up on November 7th like it's a normal day and just live right. my life and not do anything else, right? Right, that would be that would be, that would would be be sinful, at least in some venial way, because you're you're not you're not engaging. You're not caring you're, enough. You're not, li you're not living as a citizen. Yeah. You know? But to live as a citizen, if when it comes to voting and you have these two significant parties or these two major parties that are both now in conflict mm -hmm. with your you know these first principles including the right to exist and you can make the case to vote for the lesser of the two evils as you see well this one will let more people exist and this one will let less people exist or at least restrict the uh, restrict the taking of human life in some way however limited right but you could make an argument that if a let's say a gr if enough christians rose up to yes. make their votes felt their voices heard their votes felt at the voting booth to say we're going to be that voting block that will only support you if you do x y or z yes okay so i would say so they're politically active and and inaction on d the day of voting would be this very um public statement that they're making that says you can't win without us you need us and i that think that's a true willed, by the uh, way yeah, right. a willed inaction that would be tr for this other this other purpose i would say well what's the morality of that yeah. The end in view is to try to change the heart or the, the platform of the political party. Say, we want you to be more pro-life. So we're going to- And pro-marriage. And pro-marriage, all these things, all these yeah. non-negotiables. And the pro-education of children as the fam with the family, the parents being the first responsible for that. Okay. And, and in order to make that happen, we are going to, we, will, we are choosing not to vote for you because we want you to change your platform. We're going to make it hurt this time okay. around. So next so time I would you say, listen, I would say is that's the a, argument. It's a moral uh, calculus, which is a dangerous one mm -hmm. because, and we don't know the outcomes of such choices exactly, but could it be that that is actually going to propel the opposing party who are far worse on, on these matters into authority, whether that's the Senate or the White House or local government? Well, and I, so it gets, in other words, more babies are going to die for the next four years because of this choice I'm making in the ballot box today. So and that's, a, that's a moral calculus. So I think I misrepresented one. the moral calculus. So, so make it more specific to what's happening today. We'll just okay. let it all out here. The, <laughs> okay. moral, the moral calculus is this one. It's not so much all Republicans that are being pro-abortion right now okay. because many of them have been very pro-life. It's that the party has been taken over by 
President Trump, and he was the one who asked for the weakening of the platform back during the RNC. His own political he, calculus of wanting to garner more votes whatever from the middle it was, or whatever I that mean, was. You know, I, I, I have had the opportunity to talk with him personally, and he truly believes in abortion. It's not just a political calculus for him, is my understanding. So okay. he's, he's personally for abortion in addition to having the political calculus. So there's that. And then in addition to that, there is the fact that the, the, the platform, so in, in a sense, the, the party has been is being led by someone up with these beliefs, these pro-abortion beliefs, and these you know pro in whatever political calculus they're making. But down ticket, mm. you have a lot of pro-life people in the party, okay, uh, political leaders, I hope and so, so. I would hope you know so. the calculus right. could be that you go to the voting booth and you do vote down ticket to protect the House and the Senate, okay, so that you can ward off the evil of the executive branch if either it's President Trump or it's Kamala Harris, particularly Kamala Harris, because she's more proactively pro-abortion, certainly than President Trump, so that if she does get into power, she is ineffective mm. in promulgating abortion throughout the land, you know, having a sure. whatever their act is called, Reproductive Freedom Act or whatever, to enshrine Roe v. Wade federally. You know, you do need the, the House and you need the Senate, Senate for that. Right, and then sure. obviously the, you know, the exactly Supreme the Court to give to... you permission basically to do it. So that, that would be the argument. Stave off the 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 evils that could be under the democrats by ensuring that we have the house and the senate and get out the vote for that i think that um i i admire your activism so much lila and your mm -hmm. your you represent an informed voter that is extraordinarily unusual in our country unfortunately so my worry about all of that is that most people don't understand politics enough to be able to make that kind of a reckoning at the ballot box most people, uh, I wish that they did. I wish that everybody read all of the great things there are to read about forming their consciences mm -hmm. well as Christians, as Catholics, as believers, uh, as people who love the truth. So my worry is that that, um, that particular kind of activistic approach to casting a ballot is such a tiny minority of the, the, the voting population that it it's not going to actually pan out that way. Again, like I said, it's a it's a bit of a political calculus. All politics is that. Otto von Bismarck, the great German chancellor, you know, I don't know how great he was, but 19th century German chancellor said that politics is the art of the possible. The art of the possible. It's an imperfect thing. Politics is the art of the possible. And and so there we're constantly trying to figure out what is the best solution given these unbelievably impossible circumstances right now. And your approach to that is one, but I would say it's probably not something that a lot of voters would understand. So I don't, what to do with that, I don't know. Well, I, I, I do like to, yeah. I do like to, I want to get back just for a second about the the obligation to vote. Mm -hmm. And um, one more, just one more quotation, because Please I think do. it's, <laughs> I think it's, um, those higher principles are what can help people think about this stuff a little bit more clearly. So voting is a civic duty. Seems like we said, it seems to bind at least under some kind of uh, venial sin, we would say in, in the Catholic life, if, um, if there's a good candidate and an unworthy candidate, then that's clear. You should, you have a moral obligation to vote when you're choosing between a good and an evil. When it's between the lesser of two evils, um, you have a moral obligation if to vote for the lesser of the two evils, if by not doing so, you are propelling the worse candidate into office. And that's a kind of what we're talking about here. And so I, I just worry about that, morally speaking. Yeah. That's honestly, I worry about that, morally speaking. I, I think it's a very fair worry. It's a very fair concern mm. that you're expressing. And I can understand it. I, I think, you know, the, you, you, you quoted the, the infamous, famous quote, politics is the art of the possible. And the question always has to be asked, well, what, who defines what is possible yes, in any given right. situation? Which is why activism is so important. Which is why activism is so important. And, and I understand and, and I also share your concern about, well, how many people are going to go through this sort of strategic thought process of, well, if I vote, if I show up on election day and I vote down ticket, but I have a protest vote where I don't vote for the Republicans this time because of the betrayal, mm -hmm. you know, and and I'm going to vote down ticket, though, to make sure that this doesn't hurt our chances of having the Senate or the House. My actions will help that, our chances there. Mm. Uh, that will be that calculus. You know, I know your concern is, well, there's just such a small amount of people. Are they really going to make the impact they need to make? And I think the question always then is, 
do 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 we want to be the first or the second or the third right. or the fourth? If no one's willing to be the first or the second or the third or the fourth person to do this, we will never have enough people and it will never be possible. I've seen in my experience things become possible when one, two, three, enough people get up and say, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna try yes. it. And then they do things that they didn't think were possible with time. And and yes. an example of this is Planned Parenthood. You know, I remember when I was first doing this work over a decade ago, people told me at the time Planned Parenthood support is Republican and Democrat. It's by it's nonpartisan, really. Everyone supports Planned Parenthood. We know they do abortions, but they do a lot of other good things. You're not allowed to criticize them. I mean, even in the pro-life movement, there were some people criticizing them, but there's certainly no public policy to defund Planned Parenthood. Mm -hmm. That was a very impossible public policy objective. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, this is ridiculous. Of course we should criticize Planned Parenthood and anyone who supports them, Republican or Democrat. And by the or way, the, the history and the history there, by the way, I should, it would, it would be wrong for me not to say the history. It was George Bush Sr. Mm who first, a Republican, mm. who first introduced funding for Planned Parenthood. Mm, mm, yeah. So this was a Republican thing originally. Well, I think that the corporate, the corporate involvement there was obvious. So, but but all this yeah. to say, after some years of activism, we got to the point where multiple states defunded yeah, Planned Parenthood, be to God. and we even had an had a had a moment in twenty, what year was it? Twenty eleven, when after a lot of activism, I was doing, they, we had a bipartisan majority mm. vote in the house we mm. had democrats voting to defund planned mm. parenthood mm. so we we were creating we were moving the overton window yes uh, if you're familiar with the yes. concept oh, yeah, of absolutely. what is the realm of possibility right. and acceptability for right. certain political or social actions we had moved the overton window and so that's always where my mind goes is where does the where should the overton window yeah, be that's a good question. we shouldn't even be in a place where we're having to choose between candidates Seriously. where one is okay with killing and one's but not. But here they we should, are. That's right. But here we are. But yeah. how do we get out of that? Okay. So I think that, that, um, that it's, false bind. that's a really good question. I do think that, again, presenting from the details and stepping back a little bit, looking at it from the outside almost, you say politics, especially your vote, whoever you are, is especially effective. The more local the community by way of subsidiarity, the more local the community, the more influence you have at your school board in your neighborhood, in your town or city, that's the place where you actually can move the needle or or move the Overton window. It's or however, easier to it's move It's easier it. because you, you can create momentum more locally rather than just creating momentum in a ballot that is a federal election. Because there again, most of this country, it doesn't really matter, alas, how you vote for president most states it's it's going to come down to a very small number of people in a very few states where it matters as far as the electoral college mm. it really we're talking maybe tens of thousands of voters really it's that as if we can believe anything that the polls are telling us right it's going to be such a tiny number of people who determine that who's in the white house that really in a way this is all just a lot of noise for but, most people in most states. But what you're, but what you're describing, you know, again, to play devil's advocate would be, yeah, uh, be the case for saying, well, if it really just comes down to a few 10,000 people, then why, why is there such a moral obligation to vote in the federal election? Well, I would say because not just about, not just about the, the federal election, but all elections and, you know, the but common vote good. down ballot. I mean, yes. we, I think we're both in agreement. You should vote down ballot. But when I, it comes yeah, to right. this very okay. crazy, I mean, it is a, a truly crazy election, unprecedented. <laughs> yes. Joe Biden steps down, Kamala takes over. President Trump, they try to assassinate him twice. He's the incumbent from four years ago, and he's rerunning. He's in his, is he 80? Is it 79, Close, I think now? I, I don't remember, but yes, yeah, 79 you know, And then he changes the platform. He's, he goes pro-abortion. I mean, this is a very unprecedented election. Yes. I mean, everyone's saying that. And Everyone the problem that with all of that, I mean, just let me interrupt just for a second. It's also because of the lack of any civility or honesty in our political order right now, now for a long, long time, you don't really know what to believe. You know, when both candidates from both parties are flip-flopping so completely from what they said even six months That's ago, <laughs> how we don't really know what the vote means as far as once whoever that is gets into the White House and policy begins to be affected. We just don't know, which is part of the reason why it's hard it's hard to cast the vote based on what whoever he or she said this week, because I don't know if they're lying to me. Is this all just about the political expediency that we talked about with that, the, the platform change before? It's just, there's no way to know what is actually going to happen 
as far as policy goes, except for the historical track record. That helps a little bit. Mm. I, I realized, too, I didn't explain back to the kind of strategy question that I know some people are wrestling with, including myself, about what this looks like, this election, how to show up you know, on the day, on, on the day to vote. The other part of it is, if, the, if, if we, back to the lesser of two evils, you know, question and the responsibility, generally speaking, to vote, the responsibility generally to choose between the lesser of two evils, mm -hmm. I, I do, there's two things I want to ask you about. First of all, there is this argument, I should say, that lesser of two evils, we're always going to get bad people to vote for. Hmm. Politicians are kind of scumbags anyways. They're <laughs> liars. And they're always going to disappoint you because they're mere mortals. We're not electing a pastor. You know, you've probably heard this, All right? This, so yes. you're going to just have to vote for the least worst guy. That's the way this works. This is the whole project of, you know, de democracy, okay? When I hear that, and I have only heard that, by the way, since President Trump entered <laughs> politics eight years ago, okay? Before that, people would say, yeah, they're not perfect. But there was it, it seemed like there was a higher standard that we would hold candidates on both sides to. Not to say they met the standard, mm -hmm. but there was at least this... Uh, appearance of standard that I guess we had, appearance, right? a, a bit of a facade, maybe an appearance that uh, we pretended, we pretended that the characters of, especially the highest elected officials, yeah. mattered. We but, pretend but, we don't pretend anymore. But do you think it is a matter of pretending? Be, meaning, do you think? Because that's the other part of the argument. Well, we've always just pretended that they've never really mattered, anyways. The characters. I would but say, but do we really believe this? I mean, this is a serious matter well, in my is, again, view to say yeah. our public, uh, the, the most powerful person in the world, the president of the United States, their character doesn't matter, and we've just given up the ghost on that. Is that really where we're at? It's where we're at. But, but do you I don't think, think we, we should be. No, here. it's not where we should be. No, absolutely not. So this again, back to ancient political theory. You know, different forms of government. What does it mean for someone to? Yeah, what do the ancients say about how the ruler should behave? And well, what does I mean, the church you know, say Aristotle, about how the ruler Aristotle should Aristotle has a wonderful, wonderful commentary on different forms of government and and really um, government by um, elected officials, you know, it really that that's a that's a good it can be a good form of government, but it requires, like our founding fathers said, if we're worthy of it. Virtue. It requires virtue, right? And we're a long, long way as the world is growing cold in sin and, our, uh, and we're in a post-Christian world. That virtue that underlies the whole political order is very, very small right now and slipping through our fingers. But should our response to just throw it away? I no, mean, certainly not. We should, hope. we should hope and we should pray and we should, and we should try to cultivate virtue again where we're able to. Those... But shouldn't we act too? I mean, I think this yeah, is this sure. is the this is the question that we wrestle with because when it comes to elections, you know, the people who are running for office, they don't feel our hopes and prayers as much as they feel our votes. Yes. They feel what we say in a poll and yes. then they feel what we do on election day. Yes. And so that is the currency with which we which we have been given yes. to make change. And so when it comes to these un Viol the principles we cannot violate, like life, the right to exist, the right, not just the right to marry, but that marriage is between what, a man and a woman, is. which by the way, that was also changed in the, in the, in the plank. Now marriage yeah, right. between one man and woman was taken out. Hmm. So that's no longer the position of the Republican ticket at this time. Most people don't even know that because it's uncomfortable to report that when right. people want to drum up support for President Trump to right. report right. these things are yes. happening. You know, you're not anyone's favorite to be like, oh, sorry, guys, this is actually the new policy uh, of the land here for, for the Republican ticket. Um, but in all of this, you know, again, what is the response of people of good conscience to the deterioration of our political party here? That typically, that's yeah, been our so political party. Again, that's a that's a bigger question, Lila. And, and that, but that's the question I'm I'm yes. I'm concerning myself with because I I totally understand and I and I largely agree with the argument: show up to vote, vote for the lesser of two evils, all of this. But we are living in unique times. Yes, this is a unique yes. moment, and the Overton window is being rapidly moved the wrong direction. The wrong direction. The right is becoming more like the left, and Christians are powerful. This is the other thing That's that right. I think a lot of Christians don't realize is the majority of this country identifies as Christians. I think there's 60 million Catholics mm -hmm. in this country, right. if I remember the number correctly. I'm not saying they all are ready to vote, you know, and, and be activists. But if we, I think, invest more in, you know, in strengthening our wills yes. and how we show up in politics to make our 
you know, to make these non-negotiables truly non-negotiable again, I think right. it would work. But if I, we're all yeah. telling each other, no, we can't, we don't have what it takes, there's not enough of us, then we're, we're just going to see a race to the bottom. That's my concern. Well, I think that I, so I think we have to have hope. We have to pray and work for the improvement of the virtue of our republic. And we do that first in our own families. We do that then in, as I said, the, the first political entity that you, where your, 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 your voice is much more than just casting a ballot, but it's the formation of, of people. And that has to have these concentric circles spreading out. And what do we do meanwhile while the republic is collapsing? St. Augustine famously at the beginning of the, of the fifth century in the early 400s, as he was dying in Hippo, Regis, North Africa, while the Vandals were coming and besieging his city, he was the bishop, head of a monastery, my converse and I attempted to follow the rule that he wrote for us. He watched his world, the Roman Empire, christened the, the, the first place where, where Christ was at the center of Western culture, collapsing. And what did he do? He was on his deathbed. He had the penitential Psalms on the walls around him. He prayed. And for, from his perspective, the world was ending. Mm -hmm. The Vandals were ruining a city. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was the end of Christian Rome. And he prayed. I don't know if we can turn this around, Lila. I, it, this might be the, the, like the end of the Roman Republic or the Roman Empire. This might be something like that. This might be the end of our, of our kind of government. And if that's true, we have to pray and we have to hope and we hope in Christ's victory because he reigns supreme over all of these principalities and powers, right? He is the king. He will always be the king. And even if the political order degenerates so completely that it's unrecognizable for us, we still have to be good Christians. So again, the, the practicality of what do you do at the ballot box? There's a wide variety of opinion about that. I think people really need to inform themselves. Read what the church offers, the, the Conference of Catholic Bishops, conversations like this, the Abbott Circle, Five Things Every Catholic Should Know, political edition. Inform yourself. With a well-formed conscience, virtue can rise to the surface again. I, um, I'm sorry, that was a little bit of stepping away without actually answering the question because it's difficult. You're, you're asking questions that are very difficult to answer. You know, I, I I agree. I know I know it is a difficult. These are very difficult things to wrestle with, and and I completely agree with you that our call as Christians is to pray mm -hmm. and to ask for mercy. I think that is essential, and no war can be won without prayer. I mean, the prayer is you could argue our most powerful weapon. And we had the rosary. You know, we had we both were talking with Gabe Castillo yes. uh, recently, who was talking about how important the rosary is, and you know, just prayer and fasting for Christians at large. Then in addition to prayer, we have the civic duty, though, to show up. Yes. And what does that look like in a time when, in many ways, the republic is crumbling? Yes. Or even the republic isn't crumbling because we still have the ability to get a good guy in the I position. I hope so. You know, but, but what stops us, right? What, is, what would prevent us? And I think if there are enough of us in a proper democracy— there are enough of us nothing will stop us but the only way for there to be enough of us is if we set our minds to we want x and right. we're not going to be yes okay with second best right but if we're told by our opposition you're never going to get second best and we believe it mm -hmm. this is my concern it's Father almost like Ambrose. by the time we get to but we're all of that work has to be happening, not just in a federal election presidential cycle. It has to be happening in primaries, has to be happening in building out whatever party you're a member of or not, or independent project you have going on at your local level. We have to identify and raise up the kind of candidates who mm -hmm. represent the people, Christian right. worldview. By the time we get to the beginning of November every four years, mm -hmm. it's too late for that part. To some degree. I mean, I, I agree with you that this is the kind of the last round, right? I mean, we're weeks away. It is a unique time, though, because what happened at the RNC happened after we had our candidate. You right. know, P President Trump was already the nominee effectively right. before right. he changed the platform. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to discourage happened. people, but what that means is that, in fact, he lied. 
and also the, <laughs> the, the the parties don't really represent the will of the people who who make up the parties. So then, what again do we do? Because <laughs> because it, it is more complicated. It is a big question, like you're saying. You're ex- ex- exactly right about that. And it is more complicated than this than the true blue. Show up to vote. Do your civic duty. Vote for the lesser of two evils, and do our best. When there are these other complications that are that are that are happening like in real time and people are wondering what do we do um there's a powerful essay we were talking about it before and and you were um you know we were discussing it but called the power of the powerless Mm -hmm. by Vaclav havel Mm -hmm. and he talks he's writing to little pockets of resistance in the soviet union who were trying to in their whatever small way they could um speak up or fight back against the regime. I mean, it could cost them their life. They could be thrown into the gulag. They could, you know, their, have their families yes. destroyed. But he was basically encouraging them not to just always toe the party line, right? Right. right. And so, you know, think, you think about not Animal Farm, you know, yes. uh, by George Orwell or 1984. And, yes. you know, these, these, and again, I'm not saying we are in the Soviet regime today, obviously not, but we're dealing with some unprecedented times that we're yes. having to navigate. We need heroes. We need heroes. We need heroes. And I think that the, in the Christian worldview and the lives of the saints, mm-hmm. We we are presented with the church gives us examples of that kind of heroism. Saint Maximilian Kolbe giving his life mm-hmm. in a death camp under a hostile regime inimical to God and religion, mm-hmm. that is the Nazi Party, right? Um, or um, a Solzhenitsyn mm-hmm. in the Soviet Gulag, or or some of these principles like mm-hmm. Vaclav Havel argues for. You know, there is a place for authentic resistance. And heroism, that's what holiness is. That's what God has called us to be. He's called us to be saints and heroes. And that's not just about casting a ballot. It's about real opportunities in real life with this family member, with this threat to my liberty on the street, in my town, whatever it is. The heroism is going to be unique to each individual. And it has to come from the willingness to lay down my life for my brothers and my sisters like Christ asks us to. We have to be willing to die for our holy faith and for the truth of the gospel out of love, following the example of our merciful Savior who gave us what it looks like to um, to be a, a hero. Y- y- we will be his followers if we lay down our lives for our friends, right? So again, that's a principle that's a gospel principle and it doesn't tell your listeners and viewers what to do Mm -hmm. but it can inform it it can build up that life of virtue so that when the rubber meets the road and i find myself and whatever that's going to look like for the saint maximilian colby invitation then i can do the heroic thing at minimum do you think that it is important if people voting their conscience go to vote on election day and vote Republican because it is lesser of two evil in their view when it comes to abortion. They are more for restrictions than the Democrats. I'm a Catholic priest and it's mm-hmm. reckless for me to tell people how to vote. I think if you listen to what we talked about today and if you look at the options in front of you, it will be obvious as far as those three non-negotiables, which is the morally superior vote to cast. But but if they are to do that, do you think it is important as part of that exercise to make the make make it heard that this is unacceptable? The support. Yes. And how do we do because that? that? Is that letters? Is that because, you know, it's, it's not like you can't write I, on the ballot. Well, I'm not to, voting for this person because they don't they, because they're not Christian in this well, way. But I know? think just in public discourse <laughs> to kind of close, you know, to kind of explain that more and, and people see this. There's I think there is a when people, you know go MAGA. You know, they, they're they very excited about President Trump. And there is certainly a group of his supporters who are very passionate, including many Catholics of and course, Christians yes, who are right. excited to vote for President Trump. They see him as a as a hero figure, quite frankly. And, yes. and the attacks on his life have made him more of this almost hero figure that is this guy that's just fearless and he's going to fight. He's a fighter for us. And so I think people, first of all, it's natural to want to feel excited to vote for your yes. vote for your team. You yes. want to have a team to cheer for. You want to have someone who's going to save the day. You want you see what the bad things happening in the world. You want to have a fighter. That's very natural. So if you see someone that seems to fit the mold, you're going to maybe make lots of uh, you know, you know, give them lots of graces to like let them fit that mold for you because you really want that person yes. in the scary world, right? Yes. So you have this psychologically that people want this person. They see President Trump as this person 
And so you have this phenomenon and people accuse it as a cult of personality where a lot of people are just very excited mm. and supportive and protective, quite mm. frankly, mm -hmm. of President, former President Trump, in part because he gets lambasted by the media all the mm -hmm. time. That people yes. try to kill him twice. And so people are just like, I'm going to protect this guy at all costs. Right. But you're dealing with somebody who is in direct violation of the first two principles of non-negotiables. Correct. He is against traditional marriage, and he right, changed right. the platform to show that. And then he's against life. I mean, he is in support of abortions in all of these cases. Yes, definitely. Over 60% of abortions. He doesn't represent, neither party represents a truly Christian platform. That's correct. That's right. Yeah. And but, I think but, that we have to, more, we, we, but, yeah. we shouldn't be, we, it's difficult. We have to be very mature about mm -hmm. this with, with Christian courage and confidence that, yeah, you're absolutely right. There's a psychological temptation to be a member of a club and to want our team to win. That's normal for human life. That's how God built us. You know, we, we are people who tend to want to band together. But we, that doesn't mean we check our reason and our conscience at the door, <laughs> you know? So, so there's a certain, there's a certain, um, uh, we have to be detached from all of this and say, look, our citizenship is in heaven. Ours, we are not, we are in the world, but we are not of the world, we Christians. This is, we are passing through this world. It's imperfect, but it, this is not where I belong. St. Augustine is really good about this in the city of God. We are citizens of heaven. We're living in this veil of tears. And all of this that we've been talking about is so far from the perfection which we're striving for of course and and so so but, th so that that can help us to remember that i don't need to affiliate myself with a new god emperor on earth whether he's donald trump or kamala harris because <laughs> christ is my king and my citizenship is in that kingdom and i'm looking forward to getting there and i'm practicing and building up a life of holiness here below to get me there and if the more that we can manifest that kingdom here great but meanwhile, no, we, we, we mustn't fall prey to the illusions of that's my new God. Yeah, that's my new savior, whoever he or she is. We, we didn't close the loop, and I know we've got a few more minutes here. Um, we didn't close the loop on the question of what kind of character mm. to look for in a leader. Mm. And I do want to end with that because, again, I'm not here to – my show is – if anyone listens to the show knows that we spend most of our time when it comes to politics talking about life, and most of that time – when it talks to talking about candidates, talking about how pro-abortion the Democrats are. So we do that on this show frequently. Yes. But it would be wrong of me not to speak out about what is happening on the right. It would be yes. wrong. Yes. And so um, back to this question of character, and of course character is first tied to actions and what we, yes. what were the po policies that we would be instituting because it would be, I think, immoral for a Catholic to institute a policy that permits the killing of a baby. Obviously. It would be immoral. And that's why Nancy Pelosi was refused or is being refused communion by edict of the the bishop, the archbishop in the, the city of San, San Francisco, Francisco, the diocese right. of, of Northern California. And so, um, you know, you then you have J.D. Vance, who's a Catholic convert, publicly saying on national television that he supports access to abortion pills yeah, and ivf and Trump. everything else too right all of it yeah so you know i think it would become you know tribalism and wrong for us to pick one party over the other and accept immorality in one party versus another because of our previous party affiliations or right. because of our you know how much we like one's personality versus right. another or their other public policies right. versus another but it's a very interesting question and we can we can kind of um i'm curious your end thoughts on this on the one hand, I completely agree that we are living in a time when things are chaotic. There are, you know, a, a group of perhaps less than desirable um, options when it comes to politics. You know, our leaders, have they ever been virtuous? Well, they're certainly not virtuous now. The, the Republic can't survive without virtuous leadership. What is the role then of the Christian in with our ability to vote, our ability to organize, our ability to speak, mm -hmm. our ability to be activists, quite frankly. Mm -hmm, Christian mm -hmm. social activism has a long and rich tradition. Beautiful very history, Among yes. saints and, and martyrs. And so what is the role of Christians today to demand virtue and demand, obviously, living by the non-negotiables in political leadership? Mm -hmm. And again, I don't expect you to have all, all the answers. No, I know it's, it's such a, a huge question. But it's a, I, it's a, I, can't, I, I can't give you a clear answer to yeah. that, Lila, other than the, the one that always occurs to me with, with a question like mm -hmm. that, and that is we have to begin right here in my own wicked heart. The conversion of my heart is where it has to begin. What's the problem with the world? What's the problem with the American civic order right now? I am, because I'm not a saint yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The, 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 the cultivation of virtue and then maybe the ability to find uh, 
the kind of leadership that we're looking for with the kind of character that we want and hope for in a in someone as important as the president of the United States I can't wave my magic wand and and make that happen change republic the republican party the democratic party to lift up that kind of a leader I can't do it I can work can, on but I, how do I can how can I cooperate with God's grace today and beg him to change my heart and to become the saint that God made me to be. And I know that's not a satisfying answer mm -hmm. because you want to know, what can I do? Well, I don't know what else I can do. Mm -hmm. I, I need to love my neighbor. Well, and you're doing everything and more with, <laughs> it, with your, in your vocation, Father. Well, so and you are too. I mean, question, we all are. We're, we're just the doing the best I we can. The question I more should ask myself because <laughs> I, might, I mean, I, I think about what's happening and I, I think about the the silent majority, you know, and I think about the, you know, the Christian right and, you know, what the Christian has, a Christian right has accomplished in the last three decades and mm. some powerful things that have been accomplished and, and political um, power that has been achieved. And I think we need, it's time for a new, uh, a new day in um, among yes. Christians and how we behave politically, because yes. we are seeing the downside of all the things that we care about and the most vulnerable are the ones that are getting harmed because Awful. of it. That's right. And, and we can work on ourselves, we can pray, we can fast, but we can also organize and yes. we can vote. And we can demand, and we can demand that, that our political leadership mm -hmm. hear us. We can do that. We can try anyway. Whether they do or not, I don't know. But Lila, you're doing a good job Saint of Michael that. Michael, pray you know. for us. <laughs> Seriously. So I think, I think that we have mm -hmm. to... We, we have to mm -hmm. maintain that Christian um, commitment to activism as you as you are, maintain that Christian commitment to the pursuit of holiness, mm -hmm. as I'm trying to do myself and as as the, my style of religious life mm -hmm. in the Catholic Church represents, inspiring people to do that, and we bring those two things together: the pursuit of virtue and holiness, along with activism and civic engagement, and hopefully, God can use that to transform society. It's His project, not mm -hmm. ours. Amen. Thank you, Father. God bless you, Lila. God bless you. How, where can people find your uh, your work? Okay, Remind so uh, theabbotcircle.com. And hopefully, maybe when this is released, we can put some links to um, Five Things Every Catholic Should Know, political edition. But uh, theabbotcircle.com is a place to start, or our YouTube channel, or Instagram account. Thank you. So. Always wonderful to converse with you, Father. See you again, Lila. God bless you. God Peace. Bless you. A huge thank you to our partner, EWTN. EWTN is the largest religious network reaching millions of people with the truth of the faith, entertainment, and news. Check them out at EWTN.com.